Hello, Hidden Gems. It's time for another Saturday night hidden hour. Thank you for joining us. We are going to cover the topic of Tim Ballard. A lot of news has come out about Tim Ballard. We've covered him a couple of other times. And we, before we begin, want to thank many other journalists who have been covering everything Tim Ballard and OUR related for months and even years now. Uh, Fox 13 in Salt Lake City and Lynn Packer, an independent journalist who's sharing YouTube videos. Hidden True Crime, though, is going to do something and go somewhere that nobody else has done, and that's delving deep into the hidden motives and who Tim Ballard truly is. So let me explain a little bit more. Tim Ballard. I thought, I thought by the way, you were going to say we were going to climb Mount Everest or something. Same, same. Same okay, thing. yeah, the the Mount Everest of covering Tim Ballard. Right, the Mount Everest of covering Tim Ballard. So we are, uh, the journalism that other journalists have done has been incredible, and we are only going to add to the incredible work of other journalists by delving deep into the hidden motives. Uh, Tim Ballard, for those that haven't seen our previous episodes on him, is a public figure well-known for being a hero in the anti-human trafficking world. And he is the subject of the movie Sound of Freedom, and he started a nonprofit called Operation Underground Railroad. He uh, was in the White House helping, and he uh, is, is connected to Tony Robbins, a well-known motivational speaker, to Glenn Beck, uh, a well-known radio and talk show personality. So Tim Ballard um, and, and Jordan Peterson, a psychologist. Uh, so with, with, with his very public, uh, what am I trying to say? His very public, well-known persona. What am I trying to say? Persona. You didn't know the word. See, we're married. For those of you that don't know either, we're married. He knew the word I was looking for. I knew you would know. I was like, come on, John. Finish my sentence I, for me. Right. Am I going to have to start finishing your sentences now on the show? <laughs> well, you kind of helped me do well, that when true. needed. I'm yeah. like, okay, go. Yeah, jump yeah. in. So because, I gotcha. of, I gotcha. <laughs> because of Tim Ballard's very public uh, persona, we want to cover this because we feel it's very, very important. And it's not an easy subject to tackle, though. And, and we explained that in our previous episode. We have our entire playlist about Tim Ballard in the description of this video. And we recommend everybody watching previous episodes to, so that you can understand where we're coming from. John and I are very pro helping children, very, very pro saving children, and uh, very pro helping those that help children. Uh, let's just lay that out here um, for anyone that wants to say that by doing this, we are hurting um, children who could be saved. That's just simply not true. We believe in transparency and honesty and truth so that we can indeed help. I think that I, I didn't tell you I was going to start with that, but I do want to start with that disclaimer. And, and uh, last but not least, uh, the reason why now is because there was a, another civil lawsuit that came down about Tim Ballard. There is a criminal investigation now that has been opened into allegations of um, uh, alleged assault by Tim Ballard. And there has been now a documentary quote. Uh, I, I do my quote little air quotes there documentary because I did watch the first episode of the documentary. So I could share of uh, defending Tim Ballard to uh, the allegations of numerous victims that have come forward. Thus, we have received many emails from our gems and from many of you asking questions and hoping that we will take this discussion further. And we felt it was the right time for those that thought we were going to talk about the movie Rust today or not the movie Rust, the trial that's about the, the movie Rust. Um, head over. We're going to wait until the trial is completed. We are watching that trial together on our sister station, Hidden True Crime Trials, and you can find the link in the description of this video. Last but not least, before I turn the microphone over to uh, my husband, John, because really 
we need you to help us understand who Tim Ballard really is and delve into the, the hidden motives. Uh, big announcement, John and I, so, so the CW network, uh, has a new series that many of you might know about called Crime Nation. Uh, Brian Enton is a big part of that. Well, this Tuesday, March 5th, uh, Dr. John and I will be on uh, on Crime Nation's episode about the Lori and Chad Daybell case, as will many other people you know that have been on our channel. Uh, Vicki Hoban, The Woodcocks, Megan Connor, I believe, uh, will be on there. I don't know the full cast. Honestly, they didn't tell me. I asked. Uh, trust me, I asked. But those are who I know have been interviewed for this special episode. Anybody can watch The CW. I learned that. I downloaded an app. I, I downloaded a streaming app for my phone. So we will be, or not my phone, our TV. So we will be watching it. You can get that on your phone. And they will be uh, streaming it the very next day for anyone that wants to watch it. Thank you so much, Family and Criminal Law Online. Um, I do not. I have something that I am working on. I I wish, I wish he finishes my sentences and no, it's not. Um, it, I, I had skin cancer removed. So I try to wear turtlenecks for a reason to cover but this one is clearly drooping down in the front. Thank you for your support. All right. Um, so uh, let's, with that out of the way, Dr. John. Oh, and, and then um, the thing I was most wanting to tell John about this civil lawsuit that came down, and you can read the entire, it's, it's uh, nearly 400 pages, this fifth civil lawsuit very different than the previous ones. You can read the entire thing on patreon.com slash hidden to crime. We have it there. Was there a big chunk of it was an autobiography that Tim Ballard wrote about. So, so an autobiography about himself, his biography about himself that he wrote going all the way back into his early years in childhood. And we all know, John, that's like gold, right? You, you read Chad Chad Daybell's autobiography. You've read Jody Hildebrand's autobiography. <laughs> Let's just throw in Tim Ballard's autobiography. So well, it's, it's a partial, it's a partial rendering. It's not, it's not the full autobiography. It was, it was, it's a partial that was provided as a, an appendix to the civil suit. So it's a, it's attached to the civil suit, and the reason it's attached is because they reference part of it for the lawsuit. Yeah, Rebecca, uh, thank you. He did take one for the team by reading those uh, for us. And, and Rebecca, it was so good to see you on our book club. John had a great book club Wednesday night with our mini gems. For those interested in joining the book club, that's also on Patreon, patreoncom slash It was so good to see you there, Rebecca. Yes, taking one for the team. So let me jump in. I, I noticed a couple of people, I noticed a comment earlier. I just, I don't look at comments that often, but I noticed someone said immediately that they can't believe we're jumping on this bandwagon and they're unsubscribing all in caps. And first of all, on that issue, of course, people can believe what they want to believe. And we, we offer a perspective. It's based on the evidence we think is most relevant. But this isn't a bandwagon we're jumping on. We've covered Tim Ballard previously. So this is, this is not new for us. But I guess this person doesn't, isn't aware of that. So, But I, I think it's important to say, having looked at that comment, that you know, our job is to look at the evidence and evaluate it to the to the best of our ability. And some people will agree and some won't. And that's just the nature of this channel. So um, we had similar controversies in the past, other cases we've covered. And um, I should point out my disclaimer is that none of these cases are adjudicated. So none of them have been tried. There's no verdicts. There's no pronouncement of guilt or innocent. So again, I just ask people to keep an open mind. We're going to talk about this. We're mostly going to talk about this in terms of Tim Ballard's own writing. So sure, I'll be interpreting it, but 
I'm going to actually be reading a lot of his own words. So, so in that sense, I hope people can stay open here and we're not doing this to be controversial. We're doing this because we think it's important and it's important to be as accurate as possible. And so I guess that's my disclaimer. A great disclaimer. Thank you. Let's start with the civil lawsuit. I, I think the reason the civil lawsuit is interesting and relevant is because it essentially questions the narrative of The Sound of Freedom, the movie. So apparently there's, there's the company or the production studio that made this movie is called Angel Studios. And Angel Studios said that it's based on a true tale. It's based on a true story. And Tim Ballard essentially is the star of that story or the hero of that story. And they also said publicly that the person, the, the plaintiff in the civil lawsuit, Kelly, K-E-L-Y, Kelly is a resident of Columbia, uh, the country Columbia. And they say, Angel Studios says that Kelly is a real human trafficker and that the portrayal of Kelly in this movie, in the movie, her name is Katie, apparently. I haven't seen the movie, so I'm, I can't speak to the movie. I, I can only speak to what I've seen. I, I'm not going to watch this movie because I, 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 I maybe I should, but um, I just don't want to, I don't know. I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't. Let me back up that, that this movie is claiming that this is real. And, and the problem here is that a lot of it isn't most of it isn't it's fictitious. And so I think if angel studios hadn't made those claims and if, if Tim Ballard hadn't made those claims that this is his story and that it's factual, there probably wouldn't be a problem here. All they had to do was say this was fiction or that it was based on, I don't even know if they can say it's based on a true story. It's it's based on events, you know, or something like that, right? But but that's not what they did. They said this is this is a true story based on a true story depicting Tim Ballard's story and this woman Kelly. So Kelly was in prison for eighteen months in Colombia. She went to trial. Tim Ballard actually was at the trial. He testified against her. There was never a judgment against Kelly. There was never a conviction. There still has not been a conviction. She was released due to habeas corpus, meaning that she was being held for too long without sufficient evidence and without going to trial. And so it's important to point out that Kelly had no previous criminal record, that Kelly had no previous involvement in human trafficking, that Kelly was never, she was portrayed in the movie as a beauty pageant queen. She was never a beauty pageant queen. She was never affiliated with a modeling agency. There were so many falsehoods in this movie that again, if, if they just said this is fiction, it wouldn't necessarily be a problem. So, so Kelly says in the civil complaint that essentially her life was ruined. People threatened to kill her, that all these allegations were false. And so that's, that's the reason she filed this complaint. That's the reason she's pushing back. She provides a lot of evidence in here that... She provides a lot of evidence that, for example, they there was so there was a party on an island in the island of Beru, which is an island off of Colombia, apparently. There were 57 children that attended the party. The 46 of those 
were 17 and older. 30 of them were adults over 18. 16 were 17 or older. Seven were 16 or older. Only four were 13 to 15 years old. That's for starters. Kelly argues that not a single one of those children had ever been trafficked before. That none of them had been involved in the sex trade. None of them had been trafficked. That they were all recruited to attend this party because they were told that rich Americans would be handing out money. So that's interesting. I think... That, so they created a need. They created a need for trafficking. There. Right. That, that's been the big argument here. That's one of the big arguments with Tim Boward is that, to quote one of the victims from a couple of months ago, she said, OUR is not rescuing children. This is a quote. OAR is not rescuing children. They're making a morality play for money based upon fake, mostly fake operations. She said fake operations. I think some of these operations did – arrest traffickers, apparently. It's not clear how many. Some of them did apparently rescue children that were being trafficked, but at least in this movie, and according to Kelly's complaint, the the people that recruited the children were not traffickers. So I would make the, I would make the distinction between a trafficker who is, who is somebody who engages in the practice professionally of finding and trafficking children for, for monetary gain versus opportunists who seek money from rich Americans by recruiting children that haven't been trafficked previously, right? And so I think that's an important distinction. That, that I think the argument here is that this wasn't about trafficking at all. This is about a group of people, including Kelly in Columbia, who encountered a group of rich Americans who made promises about money and wanted to hold a party. And they recruited kids that supposedly were being trafficked for this party. And then the Colombian, the version of the FBI, the CTI came in and, and engaged in a raid and arrested a number of people, including Kelly. So it's interesting to me. So after our last show, in when our last show on Tim Barrow, I think was in November. Your your mic's off. Yes. You, okay. Um, I received a couple of calls from coworkers of Tim Ballard, and there's no way I'm going to reveal these sources. By the way, these are deep sources that are highly confidential. But this is important. Because one of those sources told me that he believed most of these activities were fraudulent and that, well, first of all, let's back up and talk about Tim Ballard's credentials, that he worked for the CIA for a number of years before going to Homeland Security. With the CIA, he was an analyst, which means he was never in the field. He was an analyst. He was basically a, a, a bureaucrat who sat behind a desk and a computer. He didn't engage in any operations in the field. He then moved to, to um, uh, he worked on the border for a while, and he, he did have some action there. But when he moved to Homeland Security, his main job was internet crimes. So his main job was not going in the field and busting, you know, sting operations. His main job was assessing crimes on the internet, which by the way, I've, I've had a lot of involvement with uh, those divisions of law enforcement because I've done a lot of evaluations of, of sex offenders who were caught engaging in crimes on the internet. So that's primarily what he did for Homeland Security. So one of these sources told me that Tim Ballard actually was considered a secondary undercover agent, and he was only trained for that in 2011. He started OUR in 2013. He trained as a secondary undercover agent, which means that you cannot go into the field by yourself and run an operation. You can only do that if you're a primary undercover agent. Tim Ballard was never a primary undercover agent. 
He went on one raid in a foreign country, according to my source. And that was it before he started OUR. But he wasn't primary, he was secondary. So he was subordinate to other supervisors who went on that raid. This person also told me that he believes strongly that Tim Ballard was creating a demand. This is a quote. He's creating a demand for trafficking by doing what he's doing. He said even small ops will create demand. He said to me that the way this should be done is that you collaborate with these foreign countries and you, you, you figure out that the difference between what, what Tim Bauer's doing and what should happen according to this person is that you, you get intelligence, you engage in surveillance, you figure out where these types of events are happening, where trafficking's happening, where parties are happening, where kids are being trafficked, right? You don't set them up. In other words, you, you find them and then you bust them. You don't, you don't pay people to go to a party where you're going to then, you know, bring in law enforcement. You find them, right? It, it's not, <laughs> so in some ways, the order here is reversed. The, 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 the way this should work is that your intelligence gathering should lead you to these trafficking rings, which, which should lead you to these parties. If you set these parties up in advance, you don't know if traffickers are going to supply the children or if opportunists are. That's the problem. And so Kelly's argument is that this is entrapment. Her argument I, is I, that, I, yeah, I agree. Right? Is, is that you can't pay someone, you can't tell someone you're having a party, oh, be there, we're going to give you money, and bring, by the way, bring children. Um, without that spilling over into entrapment. And so one of the interesting things in this lawsuit was that uh, was that I didn't know this, but in one of the exhibits, exhibit K, we posted this on Patreon, by the way, all the, the, the documents. Um, in Exhibit K, we learned that OUR, I don't remember the year, but OUR was sued and paid a settlement to Washington State for entrapment of a man who was part of what they called Operation Net Nanny. So this is not, this is not the first time that OUR engaged in entrapment. There was actually a, a settlement right. previously, which... So it, it certainly raises the question of what they were doing. And, you know, I, I, in one of our earlier shows, I referred to Jimmy Rex. Mm. And Jimmy Rex was a friend of Tim Ballard's. He went on operations with Tim Ballard. He argued that a lot of this, he didn't use the word entrapment. He argued that some of this was real, but a lot of it wasn't. That they went on a lot of missions where... They went to multiple cities, including Mexico City. And he, quote, he said, they never found any traffickers. And there was no trafficking. So if you go to a city and there's no trafficking and your mission is to, to arrest traffickers, apparently you stage it. Hmm. So, you know, even the most ardent of Tim Ballard supporters, I think, you know, you, you, they have to contend with people like Jimmy Rex or Paul Hutchinson, or people that work with him and knew him. So you, you can, he can point the finger at victims and say that, you know, the victims that were part of the couple's ruse were making all this up. But it's much harder to point the finger at somebody like Jimmy Rex, who's essentially saying, look, there's two problems here. Number one, we didn't find traffickers that often. <laughs> and, and when we did, Jimmy Rex said, when we did find traffickers and we did rescue children, I don't know whatever happened to the children. I don't know what happened for aftercare. I don't know if there that's was the any, biggest, if there was the any help. Yeah, there was no help that we have not. Jimmy Rex says, I don't know where they went. I've never been able to catch up with any of the victims we allegedly rescued. Where is the aftercare? Right. And so if, if, that's, that. 
if that's the case, if you just if you just move bodies from one location to the other, you're engaged in an elaborate moving operation, nothing more. You're not helping victims. You're not getting them out of their danger and their peril. You might temporarily, but eventually they're going to be they're going to go back even if they're being trafficked. They're if you're just moving kids without following up, then you're not really accomplishing much. You're just engaged in basically, a, you know, a, a moving company that's overseas that's happens to move kids, right? So, um, you know, in, in fairness, Jimmy Rex did believe that that some of the children were legit, legitimate victims of human trafficking, and they were legitimately helped. He did think that there were some traffickers that were caught and brought to justice. And so that's all good news. The civil complainants, the the five victims, or is it six now? The victims that have come forward, however, strongly disagree with that. So they think that almost all of this was a ruse. I don't, th- what the truth is, I don't know. It's probably somewhere in the middle as it usually is, but. Um, that was very measured. <laughs> Um, One of our gems said that her her husband is mad that she's watching this right now. I think you should look at look at how measured John is being right now. Um, you know, it, one of I'm going to talk about. Let's stay with these coworkers because I, you know, you people that worked with him at Homeland Security. I it doesn't get any closer than that. These are people that knew him well. These are people that worked with them. Um, one of them told me that, quote, he has a big fragile ego and, ego, and that's the problem. He used to bring a laptop to work, and he would work on his laptop writing his books. So if you want to know why Tim Ballard has 10 books out there, it's apparently because he spent all his time at work writing his books. And I, I guess his supervisor didn't care because he was promising his supervisor a job in his his company, OUR, which was going to happen in the near future. He took a supervisor with him. <laughs> he took a supervisor with him, right. Which is, so that's how Tim Ballard has 10 books because apparently his, his, his job was to investigate internet crimes, but more importantly, it was to write books at work. If only we had time to write books. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, one, so one day. The, the, the coworker also said, and I'm going to quote him here. He said, quote, when it came to casework, Tim Ballard was a zero. And again, these, these are not my words. These are coming from deep sources that, that knew and worked with Tim Ballard for years. And so um, he, he basically said that, that he felt like Tim was driven by his ego and by greed and um, that he wasn't, I'm, you know, that he felt like perhaps that, that, that Tim Ballard, in some level, he did have good intentions. But those intentions were never operationalized at work. Yeah. He was often too focused or too scattered on other projects. Yeah. So I, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about that because that, I think, helps set the stage here, too. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for setting that stage because it's important as we delve into this. Well, it's important because it. I, I'm sure a lot of people are going to argue, the Tim Ballard supporters are going to argue that the victims are all lying. And they're contradictory and whatever, like it's, it's going to go back to blaming the victim. But the problem with that argument is that when you talk to people who knew him, including coworkers, and when you talk to people that went on operations with him, including Jimmy Rex, they're telling the same story as the victims. They're, they're corroborating. And the more people that come forward and the more people that corroborate, the more likely it is that it's accurate. Right. So but do I know for sure that it's accurate? No, I don't. I mean, it's, again, none of this has been adjudicated. None of this has gone before a jury or a judge. So 
we'll wait and see what happens. As Mary says, as my mother right. always said, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> right. Um, so, so let's, let's dive into, let's try to figure out who Tim Ballard is. And I think the best way to do that is to look at his own words. You know, we have the unusual opportunity here to see parts of his autobiography that were that were attached as an exhibit to the civil complaint. So this was fascinating I'm, to me. Yeah. I'm gonna start with I'm gonna start with the words of Tim Ballard. So this is uh this is the opening of his book. This is directly from Tim Ballard. Quote, my name is Tim Ballard, and I am different things to different people. To some, I'm a hero and a humanitarian. To others, I'm a religious zealot and a con okay. artist. And a con artist, okay. To some, I am a saint fighting human trafficking. To others, I'm a glory-seeking wannabe Rambo. To some, I'm a patriot. To others, I'm an ideological propagandist. Truthfully, I may be all and none of these things. That's from his own words. He lays that out and then he says, I might be all of these things. He said he's, he's, he's all of them and none of them. So, I mean, if, if you start with that, uh, you know, it, it's kind of mind blowing in the sense that I don't, if I'm running an autobiography, I'm probably not going to say that I'm a religious zealot and a con artist. <laughs> unless unless I've had some major transformation, I don't, I don't really know why I would want to say that. I mean, I guess, I guess part of what he's saying is this is people's perceptions of him. Right. But, but he the, didn't say that though. He said, I may be all of these things. I may be all of right, these. Right. And, <laughs> and I, so I, I, right. This is, the way I normally phrase that this is what's in his mind, right? This is what's on his radar. So, I mean, he's really, he's really from the very start of his autobiography, he's giving us a complete glimpse into how he sees himself. He sees himself as that. a hero, humanitarian, religious zealot, con artist, saint, fighting human trafficking, glory seeking wannabe Rambo, patriot and ideological propagandist. There you go. His own views of himself, Shannon M says. Yes. Right. Exactly. And, you know, so that's, that's a fascinating, real, that's a really fascinating way to open an autobiography. Um, and I will say this, by the way, about this autobiography. I, I, when I read that, I think I was, I became much more open or much more receptive to reading the rest of it. I think there, in reading this autobiography, there really is a kind of pathos here. And when I say pathos, I mean, so pathos is, a, it's, it comes from the Greek for eliciting emotion, but usually it refers to kind of sympathy that a character has pathos. If you feel some sympathy for him or her. And, you know, I, 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 I felt that like there, there's definitely a lot of turmoil here. There's definitely a lot of inner conflict. You know, this is, this is someone who's really struggling in some ways to figure it out. I mean, unfortunately in the end he doesn't, but he's trying. Right. And so like that trying goes a long way in my book, at least he's trying or he was trying. I mean, until until this documentary called Unfounded came out where he blamed all the victims for everything that ever happened to him. Which is this week, this week, this week, right. This, this, this doc, so-called documentary, it's actually more like an infomercial, but he, it's, it's clearly a PR stunt. He's, he's, it was an infomercial. To, it was an he's infomercial. He's trying to take this to the public. He's trying to raise money. He's essentially blaming entire- everything. I watched the first episode of this new air quote documentary that came out because we were getting so many emails about it. And I, I listened to the first 40 minute episode and it is the infomercial 
to donate to Ballard Family's Defense Fund for the family, not even OUR or anything, just the family. Um, but but I just have to point out what you just said was very. You've read Jody Hildebrand's documentary. You didn't have, you didn't say you, you saw anything. You mean autobiography? What did you, Autobiography, autobiography thank you. you yeah yeah that's important the autobiography self-written you didn't say that about hers you didn't say that about chad daybells you're saying that in it there was a little bit of self-searching is that what you're trying to say with tim ballard yeah i mean the term i would I, that's why i use the term pathos that 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 like sympathy you know i i, I want to i mean the writing is very simple but he's a good storyteller you know, I, I want to believe his story. I want like his story essentially is that he was kicked out of the, the book is about ostensibly it's going to change, but the book is about transformation in the sense that he went through these trials and tribulations at OUR. He hit rock bottom. He blacked out. He ended up on Tony Robbins's couch. By the way, there's a chapter on that. Tony Robbins rescued him, took him in, got him help. He started going to therapy. He really wanted to figure out what was wrong. And so the book is about these that his career, his trials and tribulations, how he encounters these obstacles and he overcomes them. But you know, the so I like that. I like that idea. I like that that's sort of the hero's journey, right? That you you go on a journey and you run into trial and tribulations and you're transformed because of it. The problem with this autobiography, however, and it's only partial, he doesn't have the whole autobiography. It's just partial. But from what I can see, the problem with the auto, with that narrative is he doesn't transform. Hmm. He refers to the allegations at OUR as conspiracies. Hmm. He never takes response. He never, and he never tells us what they are. We know now what they are. We know that they're, their allegations of sexual assault. We know now that that they were investigated by the OUR board, who then found him to be liable or responsible for engaging in inappropriate behavior with employees, and that's why they they fired him. He says that he left of his own accord because he wanted to speak and write his books. Apparently, he's writing his books all the time at work, not at work. I don't know, whatever. So, but he. He claims wrongly that he wanted to, he left OUR on, on his own. That's not true. He was asked to leave. So, so again, you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot left out of this autobiography. Right. Th that he's not being honest about. Right. But, mm -hmm. but having said that, there's parts of this autobiography where I feel like he really, he sees some of these issues and he wants to confront them and he wants to change. As he points out, and then OUR gave him a severance pay and a Jeep Cherokee. Right. A severance out. pay of like 700,000, not to mention which in 2022 OUR made like $65 million from fundraising efforts. And I can't confirm this, but it appears that Tim Boward funneled, siphoned off about 14 million of that for himself. So that's, that's highly illegal, by the way, you can't, you can't take money from a nonprofit. He should be on a salary. You can't just take money from a nonprofit because you believe you're entitled to it. But apparently he did that. So. Well, now he's just requesting money for the Ballard defense fund, which they say very clearly in the quote air quote documentary is directly to the Ballard family. So, so there you go. You don't even have to worry about the nonprofit issue anymore. You can just send it directly to Tim and his family. <laughs> the defense. Fund. Right. I, I guess 14 million. Well, he, he took millions out of OUR the year previously. It's estimated he took out like 8 million. I don't know the exact numbers I'm speculating here, but Obviously, the, there's uh, there seems to be strong evidence, and this is based on the Vice reporting, by the way. For those of you who have read the Vice articles, there seems to be some pretty strong reporting that he took millions out of OUR. The Utah AG was going to investigate, but the Utah AG at the time was Sean Reyes, and Sean Reyes was going on covert ops with 
Tim Ballard. So Sean Reyes didn't pursue any of the investigations. He dropped all the charge. He, he essentially dropped the investigation. The FBI became involved. The FBI had a lot of leads and a lot of information. Sean Reyes stepped in and all of a sudden it disappeared. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. And that's when Utah started reporting on this, but then it just disappeared. All of yeah. us, right. Everything just evaporated. And, 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 Tim Ballard uses that in the book, by the way. He says in the book, in the autobiography that's the exhibit, he says that this conspiracy went away. So I, he, he was really stressed and his life was going to hell in a handbasket. And then all of a sudden the charges are dropped and he's innocent. He didn't do anything wrong, right? But he's not telling you why. He's not telling you it's because the AG was his, one of his good friends going on covert ops with them. I mean, that would have been nice to know. Not in the autobiography. You won't see that in there. Donna Lennon says, be careful, Dr. John. Tim Ballard wants people like you to believe his story. Well, clearly he's leaving a lot out and John's not missing it. So John's like, wait a minute. This this story is, uh, yeah. It's certainly yeah, I don't, interesting here. I don't suffer fools well, unfortunately. I wish I did sometimes, but... Um, you know, evidence is evidence. I have to, if, I have to go with what's, what I think is credible evidence. So let's, if we're going to dive into to Tim Ballard's psyche a little bit, we have a lot of information from the autobiography to do that. So let's do that. Let's start let's with, do it. let's dig in. Let's start with his mother. Now, it's interesting that in the parts of the autobiography I read, he refers to his mother a lot, but he never once references his father. Hmm. And Opposite quite, of Chad Daybell. Chad Daybell never right. mentions his mother. It's the opposite of Chad Daybell. Chad Daybell mentions his mother like twice, and he, but he talks about how his father was a hero. So um, His father was a big part of his birth story. His father got his mother to give birth in Chad Daybell's autobiography. His dad. It's all about his dad. Yeah. So th there's a lot. He there he doesn't say a tremendous amount about his about tremendous amount about his mother, but what he does says I think is really useful and informative in terms of understanding Tim Ballard. So I'm going to read some parts of this autobiography that refer to his mother, and then we'll we'll start piecing together uh, a picture. Right. Yes. Thank you, Lynn. Lynn says, "Ooh, mommy issues." Yeah. I had a. I had one of my one of my favorite professors used to say that all the time. He used to say, "Oh no, here we go again. More mommy issues. More mommy issues. That's right." So let's let's John see. has an eye for the mommy issues. John has an eye for the mommy issues. He goes straight to it. He's like, "Okay, here here it is. I knew when I read Tim Ballard talking about his mother. I was like, John's got it. Here you go, babe. Pick this so one." So here apart. we go. Mommy this issues. Is from, this is from the autobiography, page 6. Okay. These are all quotes. Quote. And again, these are the words of Tim Ballard. I'm not, these are not my words. So, um, so we're letting, we're letting Tim Ballard give us glimpses into his psyche from himself. Here we go. Quote. My mother was intense, far too intense. She set high expectations for us that were difficult, perhaps impossible to achieve. I became the rule enforcer. I was the self-appointed guardian who drove my siblings nuts, keeping them in line and safe in a dangerous world. So the part I would point out here is that the expectations were, quote, impossible. Think about that for a minute. Impossible expectations. That's going to be important. That is important. Here's another this quote. Is from, again, this is from Tim Ballard's own words. His, him looking back at his childhood, what he felt that it was impossible to, to live up to expectations. Okay, go ahead. Here's more from about his mother. This is page seven. Quote, throughout my childhood, my siblings and I lived in fear of any kind of academic failure that would earn our mother's wrath. Despite mostly good grades, I still was barely accepted at BYU. Hmm. Page nine. 
Tim did not realize that John, Dr. John Matthias would be reading this. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't, well. <laughs> but thank you, Tim. Thank you for giving us a glimpse. Page nine, quote, my mom's sense of order and perfectionism, her drive to control, honestly, wouldn't allow her to see things any other way. Wow. And last but not least, this is a great one. Quote, I didn't even consider the good cape, good, I quote, let me repeat it. I quote, I didn't even consider that good people were capable of being evil, of doing evil acts, or conversely, that evil people were capable of doing good. It was a black and white worldview I'm certain I learned from my mom. She raised me to believe in right and wrong, good versus evil, and there was no room for ambiguity or second guessing between the two. Wow. As you like to say, John, I joke that John always has this quote, that's all you need to know about whoever we're talking about. And I would say, wow, that's all you need to know about Tim Ballard right there. Wow. Wow. So when I wow. read this, this is going to be relevant for something we're going to talk about later, but um, people may not understand my reference at this point, but this is, I'm foreshadowing here. <laughs> um, back in the early days of Christianity, there was a Persian prophet by the name of Mani, M-A-N-I, in the third century A.D., who founded a religion called Manichaeanism. So M-A-N-I-C-H-E-A, wait, <laughs> A-E-I-S-M, Manichaeism. And Manichaeism was based on the idea of duality, that the universe was essentially all good and all evil, and it was about the competing forces of good and evil. And so it was a very simplistic kind of reductive religion that saw everything in the universe that could be explained by these forces of good and evil. So this, this religion, by the way, was, was occurring around the time. So a lot of, I think a lot of people don't realize that Christianity early in the days after Christ was not the predominant religion initially, that there were a lot of religions that were kind of competing for people's attention, including Gnosticism, um, Zoroaster, Zoroastrianism. There were, and this was one of them. Um, and when I read this, I actually kind of thought that like when, I, you know, that this idea of good, that the world is just good and evil and th these forces of good and evil are always competing and clashing and that's all it is. Right. So you're either all good or all evil. Um, and so he's kind of alluding to that. He's alluding to that issue here. Um, and again, I'll, we'll get back into we'll get back it later into why that's relevant. So I, so he's painting, let's, let's think about this for a minute. He's again, these are his words. He's painting a picture here of a mother who is harsh, demanding, unrealistic, right? She has impossible expectations. And I think the obvious consequence of that is that a child subjected to those conditions is going to feel highly inadequate. There's going to probably be a deep seated sense of inadequacy that in many ways you have these expectations that you can never achieve. You'll never reach those to, to obtain his mother's love. He feels like he needs, to, he needs to reach these impossible expectations, but he can't, he tells us here, his grades were okay, but he barely got into BYU. Yes, someone mentioned it sounds like he failed the ACT or didn't do too well. <laughs> right. So clearly he wasn't meeting expectations, right? And one of his professors, I should point out, one of his professors told him at BYU, he said, hey, dude, you're no academic. You need to be a practitioner. Right? That, that's not exactly a huge compliment either. <laughs> but, no. Um, but you have, so you you have, when you have a mother like this, I think that, with these really impossible expectations that 
invariably, I think, you, you know, you're going to, you're going to have the sense of inadequacy or you could develop the sense of inadequacy because you can't reach those expectations. So I think one response to that is you resort to fantasy and you create this rich fantasy life where you do meet those expectations. And you, you know, potentially if you go far enough with those fantasies, by the way, you potentially start getting into the terrain of narcissism. And I should point out another thing he talked about in his autobiography was this belief that, that he, well, he loved as a child, he loved Superman and he wore his Superman cape to bed, to sleep. He wore it in the bath. So he was, he was sort of obsessed with Superman. Um, And so he, referencing this later as an adult, this is page 25 in his autobiography. He says, quote, I always believed for as long as I could remember that I was a protector, even without a cape. I was the self-appointed family guardian against the terrors of the world. I was a force of good. It was up to me to keep the evil away. I didn't need a cape. I didn't need superpowers. I simply believed. I was Superman. He's saying wow. here, he's saying here that he believed even as an adult working for Homeland Security, working for the CIA, he believed that he was quote, I was Superman. He thinks that. So again, wow. getting back to this idea. So how would someone get to that point? I mean, it's you. So you, let's go back to the mother. You have, these unrealistic expectations that he can't reach. You have this rich fantasy world where he, he immerses himself in the Superman eagle ideal. So an eagle ideal, by the way, is a persona that we wish to achieve. So it's a wish. It's an ideal. It's not a reality. So can we call this the Superman ruse? <laughs> yeah. That was a comment. Um, I totally took that from one of our gems. I saw it scrolling. I can't keep up with all the great comments here, guys. Thank you, though. So you have you you have the sense of inadequacy because he's not living up to expectations. You've got this. So you have a child who's resorting to fantasy, thinking he's Superman, quite literally thinking he's Superman. He's sleeping in the cape. He's bathing in the cape. He creates this ego ideal. So children who can't measure up, they create this ego ideal. And when they can't live up to it, they feel like a failure. Mm -hmm. Right? So yeah. you, can, you, can start, you, can, you can start to put together the pieces now and see where I'm going with this. This idea yeah. of feeling like a failure and never being good enough, right? That's clearly in play here. And, yes. and I think um, ultimately the, the end result of that dynamic is you get something like imposter syndrome. People are, people, they're pointing out, they're like, oh my gosh, just call him Tim Ballard Hildebrandt. Someone else is saying Chad Daybell sounds like this guy. Someone else is like, oh my gosh, he's got Lori Vallow syndrome. I mean, we can't not notice all, this is a similarity between all of these, uh, you know, I don't know what they are. Tim Ballard is not a criminal uh, yet, no, but right. he is not. Yeah. He's not a criminal, but he is being investigated for criminal um, acts. So, but right. but the, I think our viewers are right in the sense that um, our viewers are absolutely correct, and that the the insight here is that a lot, if there is such a thing as the criminal mind, and that's debatable, but but there are a lot of commonalities mm -hmm. among the among criminals and the criminal psyche, and I I think so. Yes, I think we're starting to see those with with Tim Ballard. So. If the question now is, could Tim, could Tim Ballard have engaged in criminal acts? The answer would clearly be yes, because he he thinks like almost everyone else we cover, right? And so right. <laughs> when I when I when right. I talk about this ideal, this ego ideal, and the inability to meet it, uh, and feeling like a failure, I'm gonna read. I gotta read this quote from this is again. This is right out of his autobiography. So I mentioned that he feels like a failure. Here we go. Quote. Oh boy. Page, okay. Page 45. From the time I was a boy and I first put on that Superman cape, 
I believed I knew who I was. I believed I knew my identity. And through a lifetime of studying and training and serving, through 18 years of fighting crimes and not dealing with the emotional fallout, I thought I knew who Tim Ballard was. (coughs) Excuse me. That's okay. I thought I knew who Tim Ballard was, but the truth now was crushing me. I was an imposter. I thought I was a hero. I thought I could save people. I can't save anyone. I can't even save myself. I'm not Superman. I am nothing. That's from Tim Ballard. That sort of answers Becky Carter's question. Isn't wearing capes and pretending to be superheroes just... Becky Carter's question. Isn't wearing capes and pretending to be superheroes just a normal childhood experience? Well, yeah. And... um, (coughs) Excuse me. We'll work on the mute button. I'm the editor, so I'm always trying to get... Yeah, I know. I don't... He's been sick. He's been sick. John's yeah, been sick. Yeah, sorry, guys. I've, I've been losing my voice the last few days, so I'm trying to hang in there. But, um, yes, right. That's that's where when a child – so developmentally, most children outgrow this notion of the ego. The, the, the ego ideal changes from something like Superman to something more realistic. So children might go from Superman to like a sports hero. And that would be more developmentally appropriate. But with Tim Ballard, so there is something, to answer that question, there's something very regressive here. I mean, very infantile in the sense that thinking you're Superman when you're 45 years old is very childlike. So yes. uh, she's completely accurate with that. Or but here we, have t- here we have Tim Ballard saying that he, he recognizes he's an imposter. Right. So, and, and again, this, this gets into what I said earlier about, there is some pathos here. Like he, he has moments. He has these moments where these moments of recognition, where he sees through the facade, mm-hmm. where he takes down the mask, where he is vulnerable. Huh. And, and, and that's one of those moments. He's saying, look, I'm an imposter. I, this is all nonsense. I mean, he, he, he doesn't keep that up. He doesn't sustain that type of insight, but he, he has a moment where he sees it. It's true. That's, that's more than Hildebrandt or Lori Vallow or Chad Daybell. You're saying he, he, there's this moment and he says, yeah, I'm an imposter. He says, here's another quote similar. He says, page 27, he says, quote, there were times, if I'm being honest, when the weight of being Tim Ballard felt like a role. His own self, that being Tim Ballard, being who he is, felt like a role. Felt like a role he was playing. Wow, that's like absolutely a zero sense of self. So it would be wow. It's a role on you're page, playing to be Tim on, Ballard. Right. And on page two, he says, quote, sometimes I'm not sure I even know myself. You're telling us this, Tim. Wow. Wow. And I'm so I think what's important here is. That, you know, so uh, as everyone who listens to this knows, I'm not diagnosing now, but that a classic narcissist, and again, I'm not saying Tim Ballard's a narcissist. I don't know. I'm not diagnosing, but narcissism is based on this idea. So if you think about the actual myth of narcissus, you have narcissus is looking in the pond and he only sees his image. He only sees his physical image, right? There's nothing of substance. He doesn't see behind the image. He doesn't see his, what he might value, like his values, his beliefs, right? If there's only an image. And, and in a classic sense, that's, that's what narcissism is. It's an image that's reflected back to us typically from other people. The narcissist wants, more than anything else, the narcissist wants constant validation from other people, which to them is a form of love. And I definitely think you have something like that here in the sense that Tim Ballard really, the, the Superman ego ideal is, is, is important because it shows that's how he wants other people to see him. And one way he creates that is by getting, he, he finds the perfect field to fulfill that fantasy. 
He gets them to rescuing children from human traffickers. What could be more, I don't know, noble than that, right? And so he sets up this whole identity based upon reinforcing this image that he's trying to create, this image of the hero, this image of the Superman, this image of this larger, he says it here, and he says it in his, I just read the, a glory-seeking wannabe Rambo. Right? A hero. A hero and a glory-seeking wannabe Rambo. He knows. At some level, he knows. Your vo- your mic. He does know. He knows. A.K.A. the cat lady uh, states, the imposter syndrome would explain why he separated Tim from his alter ego, Brian, in the documentary. He admits he did those things, but as Brian, I just have to point that out. It does make this Brian, Brian Black character a little bit more yeah. interesting. Right. And so to, to remind our viewers of who Brian, Brian Black is, we talked about this in one of our earlier shows. Brian Black is Tim Ballard's alter ego who goes on ops. So his identity on operations is Brian Black, which I, I find endless, endlessly fascinating because, you know, there's so many pseudonyms you could choose, but to choose a word, the Brian Black, like, right? Like he's not the, you know, that, that suggests he's not the guy wearing necessarily wearing the white hat. He's the guy dressed in black. And so for though I reference Westworld, the guy in black is a guy who started out really good, but then transformed into this really evil guy. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, in, in some ways you have potentially, you have, I'm not saying Tim Ballard's evil by any stretch, but you have, you have a little bit of that type of transformation that if there is this narcissism in Tim Ballard, that in many ways it's those qualities that push him over the edge or potentially push him over the edge. Um, because, narcissists have a huge amount of a sense of entitlement. They lack empathy. They're more, they're more likely to take advantage of other people. They're more likely to, in the case of his victims, they're more likely to push the envelope given the, you know, given the, the, the chance to exploit people potentially, they're, they're probably more likely to do that. Justine is asking, do narcissists though have such self-awareness? Well, that's, what's interesting. So, right. That's a great question. That's again, going, going back to this idea of pathos and sympathy. This is why I have a certain amount of sympathy for Tim Ballard, because there is some insight here, but the, but what's really fascinating, I think is he doesn't stay with those. He doesn't stay with that. Hmm. He has these moments of insight but he reverts back to who he was. And that gets into ter- the territory of personality disorders. So if you really want to understand personality disorders, this is, and again, and I'm not saying he's a personality disorder, but if he was, somebody with a personality disorder might have these moments of insight and these moments of self-reflection and these moments of potential transformation, but they can't sustain them. They revert back to who they are. And in this case, Tim Ballard is kind of telling us he doesn't know who he is. He's playing a role. Yeah, he doesn't know. He doesn't even know who Tim Ballard is. I also want to point out that uh, a book on narcissism, I believe it was called Malignant Self-Love. I'll confirm that. That was written by someone who claims that he is a narcissist. So there are narcissists out there who understand that they are narcissists. In fact, there. and then if you wiki this, uh, author, the wiki actually says that he took tests and they think he's more along the lines of a psychopath, but he wrote a book about narcissism. So that does happen. I, I'll Google that information. I threw that one out of my hat just now. So I'll get the facts on that while you continue on. So I'm going to read something else that, now that we're on this topic that is really important. And this is on page 29. He's talking about starting OUR and how important his brand was. So he says, 
He says, quote, I know it must sound narcissistic that I had a desire to grow my brand. It probably was. It definitely was. It was also the truth. So here you have on page Tim ba- on page 29, Tim Ballard is telling you that he's a narcissist. <laughs> yeah. Will you read that again? That was, there have been so many whoa moments. I keep thinking this is all you need to know about Tim Ballard. And you keep pulling these. I missed that reading through. Wow. Page 29. He says, um, I'll read the sentence before to put it, give it more context. He says, he's talking about leaving OUR and his brand. He says, quote, I felt confident that I could safely step out of the management executive role I'd been in since 2015, 2013 and allow OUR to be its own thing while I spent t- some long overdue time focusing on other things like growing my brand. I know it must sound narcissistic that I had a desire to grow my brand. It probably was. It definitely was. It was also the truth. That's in writing. Tim Ballard saying essentially he's a narcissist. I mean, he's saying he has narcissistic tendencies, I guess, but I, I don't know. I don't know a lot of people that like Tim Ballard that refer that use the term narcissistic in their autobiographies without somehow, you know, acknowledging that that's a part of who they are. Yeah. And also it's not, it's not necessarily narcissistic to grow your brand, but what is his brand? His brand is Tim Ballard or creating. Yeah. His, right. His brand he is, his brand is Tim Ballard. Who he doesn't know. And he doesn't know who Tim Ballard is. So he's creating it. Well, and we know we know from the infamous whiteboard meeting, we talked about that in one of our previous shows, but the whiteboard meeting essentially said the whiteboard, whiteboard meeting was really quickly whiteboard meeting that was at Paul Hutchinson's house, whiteboard meeting, this this infamous whiteboard picture where it shows Tim Ballard's written down all of the funnels and how to get the money and how to brand Tim Ballard and the the sizzle. Go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Right. Glenn so Beck the, was the, there. <laughs> The summary of the whiteboard meeting is that everything in Tim Ballard's universe existed to assist him. Right. And to reinforce his ego and his pocketbook to make him rich and famous, essentially. So OUR was a vehicle to assist, to enhance Tim Ballard's wealth and fame. That's the, that's the gist of the whiteboard meeting. Yeah, and the people that were there, by the way, were were were, were just shocked by <laughs> by the whiteboard meeting because they believed they believed that that Tim Ballard had a larger vision, which was to help kids, and and that OUR was was really about stopping human traffickers and and rescuing kids. And it turns out that the, at the whiteboard meeting, at least many of the people there felt that. The purpose wasn't that at all. It was to enrich Tim Ballard. And, and I want to point out, plan. yeah, and I want to point out what WK is saying. She, she thinks OUR, the Operation Underground Railroad, was Tim's brand, and he hid behind his brand. But no, the, the, his brand, according to the whiteboard meeting and according to Tim Ballard himself, is actually Tim Ballard. OUR was there to serve Tim Ballard. If you go look at the whiteboard meeting, everything was to serve and to promote Tim Ballard. You know, Jimmy Rex even shares that story. Right. Of, can I share that story? Or, you know, we, we talked about that story on an older episode about how uh, Tim Ballard was really, really upset when they were, they were sharing um, Operation Underground Railroad and the different special ops they went on. And he was very, <coughs> Sorry. I know he doesn't mute. So I just stop. <laughs> <laughs> so he uh he was really upset that he wasn't in the photos which if you really cared we pointed out about child trafficking and staying undercover you probably wouldn't want your face shown ever on any of the material but not Tim Ballard Tim Ballard was very very upset 
that at this presentation about OUR, that his face wasn't on every single piece of material. Right. So, yeah. So, right. So let's go a little deeper. If we're going to understand Tim Ballard, I, I talked about the quotes from his mother. One question that, that I wonder about is whether there were attachment issues. That's something we talk about a lot, but it seems to me that the, there probably were some attachment issues. So just in the broadest terms, attachment for children, especially young children would be classified as either insecure or secure, insecure, attachment tends to be a predictor of future problems, significant future problems in many areas, including most particularly relationships. And um, just based on the way he talks about his mother and his behaviors, it seems to me that there were, there were probably or could have been insecure attachment issues. One of the, the issues with insecure attachment is that oftentimes love is conditional. So in other words, the parent will have conditions that have to be met for them to provide attention to the child. And when that happens, the child receives the message that the child has to achieve. So the relationship is based on achievement and performance and not true connection. So love becomes a type of achievement. And I think, I think you, you definitely have something like that here too. That if there is an insecure attachment, it seems to me I'd probably go with something like anxious ambivalent an anxious ambivalent attachment, which is a type of secure attachment. Um, and again, this is just speculation, but, but this idea, I think that, that love is conditional and that it's, it's acquired love is acquired through achievement, I think is very much in play here. And then, and then we have, we have Tim telling us when he talks about what I call the Manichean worldview of, of evil versus good which goes back to the third century, uh, this idea you have obviously this very rigid, oversimplistic worldview where everything is, is good or evil. And um, what's interesting to me there is that this kind of Manichean worldview uh, was never, he never challenged it. He never, he never really explored it or adapted or learned, you know, that a lot of kids will, they might have this type of worldview when they're very young, but developmentally they might challenge it or question it or when they go to college they'll do reading and start seeing other perspectives not with Tim Ballard Tim Ballard always kind of maintained that perspective uh and so I think when you put together those pieces just based on the the comments or the 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 quotes from his about his mother I think you really start developing a bit of a psychological portrait of who Tim Ballard is Are you there? Yeah. <laughs> John's doing magic tricks. <laughs> or he just dropped the mic. Who Tim Ballard is. Oh, I thought you were I thought you were trying to drop me. No, 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 no. Don't worry about it, family and criminal law. It was a great question. I'm not worried. <laughs> Thank you for for your for your wonderful support. We appreciate you. Um sorry, I, I got a little startled when you disappeared. I'm back, but um There are a lot of good questions. Anything else, babe? Um, in a minute, but let's, that's, that's the, I think that's, that's the bulk of the, my assessment of his autobiography. There is something I want to finish with along those lines, but um, should we take some questions first? How are we doing on time here? Yeah. I have some questions. We have about 15 minutes. I do have some questions. Uh, I've been starting some questions. I have my own personal question. Um, another thing I saw in this lawsuit, which we've talked previously about, there are some strange connections as well to other cases we've been covering, but in text between him and one of the alleged victims, he states something of the sexual nature to her Um and that they know each other really, really well. And they have a connection. And she says, oh, yes, because of the past lives thing. It's a very, um, I saw your eyes go up when I said that. In other words, 
In other words, Tim Ballard had told this woman about being together in a past life or he believed in past lives. And I guess I don't, I don't know if you have any answers for me. I know it's off topic, but I just wanted to point that out too, is this idea that he, he was indeed hanging out with this subgroup of, of uh, Chad Daybell preparing a people crew and they all knew each other. I guess what is the similarity there? Uh, what is, what is that similarity, that type of person? They're all hanging out and they're all, I think where he's learning the past lives thing is they all have these, they're all, they all have the same belief system. Clearly they're all speaking at the same conferences and attending the same conferences. When I say subgroup, I mean like it's the church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, there's nowhere in the doctrine that has uh, that, that talks about past lives, but there's this sort of subgroup that believe in it. Do they all have something in common? something like-minded that I'm missing? Is it the black and white thinking? Is it, what is it? That's my personal question. And I don't know if you have an answer for me. And we have some others here too, some other questions. I think, well, you know, I, I referenced this, this idea of the Manichean worldview. I, I think there's something there, something that has to do with that. And that, that would, maybe that would reduce itself to, you know, this rigid, overly simplistic view of the world. I mean, he, he says, when talking about his mother, he says quite clearly that his mother couldn't tolerate ambiguity, and neither can he. So, and same with thing, the same is true of Jody Hildebrand. You know, interestingly, uh, Tim Ballard, so there's a story in here about Tony, that he collapses in a parking lot, and Tony Robbins takes him back to his apartment and gets help for him. And he gets into therapy and he goes to see a psychiatrist and he gets medication. And he mentions his diagnosis. One of his diagnoses is OCD. And I think that's just interesting too. Uh, and again, this is from Tim Bauer, not from me, but he claims he has OCD and PTSD. Of course, he doesn't mention anything around a personality disorder. That would be, that would be, I'm sure, left out. But but I think OCD, Jody Hildebrandt is, I think, probably has some OCD too. Chad Daybell has some OCD. You know, it, and again, I'm not, I don't want to generalize and say all criminals have OCD, but it, it tends to be a, a, a fairly common characteristic of a lot of criminals in the sense that they ruminate, that they obsess over certain things and they can't let them go. And when you have violent fantasies and you obsess over it, it's more likely you're going to act those fantasies out. If you're having sexual fantasies, in the case of, of Tim Ballard, when you're creating this couple's ruse, if you're having those types of fantasies and you're obsessing over them and you, you, don't, you have the sense of entitlement and you have poor boundaries, it's much more likely you're going to act those things out, those behaviors out. So I think that this combination of this very rigid, overly simplistic view of the world and maybe OCD and probably some attachment issues, I think you start seeing some similarities among a lot of those cases. Thank you. Michelle she gives us some great advice. Ladies, if any man comes up to you with the past life line, regardless of how you feel about yourself, you can do better. <laughs> Let that be a lesson. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So we have some good questions here. Krista Gardner though. I like it. This she says, this sounds like a bad lifetime movie waking up on Tony Robbins couch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I love it. I'm just going to take that in. Thank you. That's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a great quote. Yeah. I, w I wouldn't want to do that. Um, but the or just number a good one, bar story. Just a good bar story. And yeah, then I like woke up on uh, Tony Robbins couch. <laughs> It's like uh, it's like the movie The Hangover meets The Secret or something like that. I don't. No, it's like it's like The Hangover meets Sound of Freedom meets The Secret. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry, everyone. I always say, if you don't laugh, you cry. So we got to have some humor in the true crime world. 
Um, and for those that suffer with OCD, John also talks about criminals that suffer with depression and how depression plays a role. And John himself talks about how he too suffers with depression and he's not a criminal. We are, we are merely yeah. trying to figure out who Tim Ballard is. It's not right. There's no particular element that makes a criminal. It's the, it's a combination of elements that are all idiosyncratic that come together that lead to criminal behavior. So um, yeah, I, I think many people suffer from mental health issues and they don't commit criminal acts. In fact, quite the opposite. They're probably more self-aware and more sensitive to other people because of some of their issues. So it, it with all of these people, it's really a unique cocktail. It's a unique mix of elements that has to come together to lead to criminal behavior. Yeah. Shelly W states, they were all legends in their own mind. That's a, that's the thing. And then, and then someone yeah. else said, well, in a past life, they were probably all farmers or peasants or something like that. I would like to know who Tim Ballard thought he was. If anybody out there watching knows who Tim Ballard thought he was in a past life, I'd love to know, you know, Chad, I, Dave all thought he was the Holy ghost. And then the best friend of Jesus and James, the just, um, other people thought they were Isaiah. We don't have Chad Daybell here with his pendulum to tell us who he said that Tim Ballard was. But if anybody knows, I'm going to go Ballard with was. I'm going to go with Moses or Alexander the Great. Probably Alexander the Great. I'm going to go further. I'm going to go with my little speculation. Who did he have play him in The Sound of Freedom? What was his name? Oh, uh, the actor. Yes. I just Jim, forgot his I name. I can't forget his last name. Jim Cavasil or something. Do you know what else he you know who else he played, right? In another no. movie? No. Jesus Christ. Oh, he was in he was in the Passion of Christ. He was Jesus Christ. Okay. And Tim Ballard handpicked him. He's that's who he said he wanted to portray himself. So there you go. I don't think he looks like Tim. So why else did he choose him? I wouldn't say that they're, that's his doppelganger. But that's who Tim Ballard requested to play him in The Sound of Freedom. Yeah. So, so I wonder if he thought he was Jesus, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So we're, 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 we're on kind of a strict timeline here, right? Oh, yeah. We are in a strict All trial right, so here. Yes. Let's what else, let, me, babe? let me get back in and wrap this up. So I want to conclude with kind of the final piece here, which I think is really critical and that's the relational component. So I mentioned, I mentioned this idea of insecure attachment and how that type of attachment style will typically lead to, to future problems, relational problems. Um, one thing that, that Jimmy Rex talked about in his show, what was it, three months ago, was that Tim would kick everyone out of OUR that criticized him or the organization that disagreed with them, that somehow faulted him for anything, right? And and this gets back to the idea of his mother being a perfectionist, I think, and this, this internalized perfectionism that Tim Ballard showed that clearly was a part of his upbringing. Um, so you have it in you have it in the organization. You have Tim really struggling to develop these deep connections that can last. He, Jimmy Rex ends up getting kicked out. All of his friends eventually get kicked out, especially if they're critical at all. And Jimmy Rex was obviously pretty critical. So, but let's extend that a little bit here. Um, in his autobiography, he talks about. He talks about the demands of OUR and how difficult it was. He talks about his wife, Catherine. He, she, he says, quote, <clears throat> she wouldn't stop me from doing what I needed to do because she knew all too well what it would mean if I stopped. At the same time, however, Catherine needed a husband. And for some reason, I couldn't be one. Wow. Skipping ahead, page 32. 
That was page, for those who want to look at this document, that was page 31, page 32. Wow. They're all, you can find all of these documents on our Patreon, patreon.com slash hidden true crime. And thank you for your support for anyone that does join Patreon. Wow. So on page 32, um, continuing with this the issue about relationships, he's talking about being pushed away from Catherine and being pushed away from his family. Catherine, his wife. Okay. He said, I loved her very much, meaning Catherine. It's not that I was indifferent to the kids. They were everything to me. It was something else. I was important. I was important in ways that honestly did not include them. I was regularly on TV. I was hanging out with celebrities and world leaders I was consulted on issues of national and international importance. I was literally sitting at the right hand of the president of the United States. I was famous and getting more so by the day. Oh. So he just pretty much expressed that he's indifferent to his family because he's famous. Is that what I heard? Is that what I got? What he says, what he says here. So he's, He's, he's talking about this because remember he's in 2020 when he gets accused of inappropriate behavior at OUR and he's, he's going to get removed from OUR. That's his fall. That's his downfall. So he's, he's trying to set this up to show how his ego became inflated. But what he's saying is he's saying he's struggling in his marriage and he's struggling with his family because quote, I was important. I was important in ways that honestly did not include them. In other words, what he's saying, which this is mind boggling. So this is the key to understanding Tim Ballard. This is probably the key to understanding a lot of criminals. It's this relational component. He doesn't know how to connect to his wife. He doesn't know how to connect to his family. He doesn't quote, know how to include them in spite of his fame. So he's getting famous he feels he's 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 getting all this attention and somehow it has to be about him. He can't he doesn't see his family as a part of his identity and his life. Yeah. He's just obsessed with the right. fame. Right. And the fortune. And so the reason I, I think this is important is because and this goes with the Jimmy Rex issue about kicking everyone out of OUR that's close to him, that supports him, that criticizes him. The reason this is important is because in many crimes and among many criminals, you have this element of disconnection. And you see it here. You see this lack of empathy. You see this sense of entitlement. You see this inability to sustain relationships. And I, I think that's probably one of the biggest commonalities uh, um, in the criminal mind. And again, I, you know, Tim Ballard is not a criminal, so I, I want to, but, but I mean, he's, he's, there's a lot of lawsuits out there. Uh, we don't know how they're going to go, but, um, but they are allegations, but still, if, if we're trying to understand Tim Ballard, I think this is a good place to think about it, that, that one of the, if I, if I think about psychopaths, for example, a lot of the research on psychopathy shows that psychopaths have this issue of, of connecting to other people because they lack empathy, because they, they don't have emotion. They don't have true emotion. They can't truly connect to other uh, human beings at an emotional level. And so I think there's always this, this kind of trail of destruction that psychopaths leave in their wake because they treat people like objects. And they don't know how to fully connect and, and, and to manage relationships and to sustain them. And, and I think if you see it from that perspective, and Tim Ballard here is telling us that he's, he's disconnected from his wife. He's disconnected from his family because he's becoming so famous and he cares about fame more than anything else. And I, so I think you have this element here where, uh, 
where I think there there could be issues around personality that that really create a lot of the conditions for Tim Ballard's downfall. That was your mic drop. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so that that that's I know we're kind of running out of time, but yeah, so I, I think that would that's where I would conclude because I think in the end that a lot of these issues come down to this inability to connect and probably seeing people as a means to an end, seeing people as objectifying people, you know, not having this capacity to really read social cues, to read emotional cues, this lack of emotional intelligence, uh, the sense of entitlement, right? A lot of these things are, are, are common to personality disorders. But again, I'm not saying this is a personality disorder, but it may be speculating here. It, it, you know, he calls himself narcissistic. He calls himself. He does an, it. He, does it. he right. calls himself an imposter. So I, I guess if I believe him, then this is kind of where I would land with my analysis. Thank you, babe. Um, we're a little bit better time-wise. I took care of some things. Okay. Thank you, Lady Sunflower. And we will we'll conclude, but I do want to share that someone just sent me a text. Okay. And uh, she was there. She was at a time where there was a dinner honoring human traffic survivors, and that Tim uh, flew in on a helicopter into the event. A real Captain America moment for him. Those attending the event. We're not impressed with himself creating such an image and a spotlight for himself. The moment completely overshadowed the human trafficking survivors who were being honored at the event. And I think that's just another great example of someone that's really fighting human trafficking. I just want to point this out to people. They don't care about what they look like or their fame or their Instagram account. They're hiding because they're helping people undercover. I just, people always ask us for some tells or some, some things to look out for. Like, just think about that. Well, uh, let's, <laughs> let's, let's tell a similar story. And again, I'm, I'm quoting Jimmy Rex a lot tonight, but Jimmy Rex told about Jimmy Rex put on a charity to raise money for human trafficking. And he said that a couple of people in OUR are up on the stage with a picture of, of some good work they had done with a victim of trafficking and Tim Ballard wasn't mentioned. He wasn't in the picture and he was so incensed by that. He was sitting at a table close to the stage. He ran off and he went to the back. He went behind the stage and he got into an argument with someone about why he wasn't mentioned, why he wasn't in the picture that they held up. That right, it was about him and not not mm -hmm. the charitable function. It was the same, it was the same idea that he was the star. He he wanted to be the center of attention, not the victims of human trafficking, not the children, not the fundraising for the children. Tim Ballard. Exactly. So, but yeah, that story that that is not that story. I mean, it's. Yeah. That story is great because it it or it's 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 diagnostic of who we're talking about of his of Tim Ballard's personality because it clearly shows this is more about Tim Ballard's ego and his fame and fortune than it is about the 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 children and yeah. uh, and that's that's the tragedy of this is there was so much money raised for these noble causes that could have gone to I think to to charities that would have really helped. Yes. Once again, for anyone wonder, John is literally not diagnosing anyone. He has read Tim Ballard's words, Tim Ballard calling him nar himself a narcissist. And John is saying he doesn't know if he has a personality disorder. So we don't need to put pretend things going on in, you know, chat. Yeah, no, I, let's, I'm, let's I'm reading not be Tim Ballard here and twist things. <laughs> I'm not diagnosing. I'm, I'm, I'm using his word. I've made that clear. So just to reiterate, I don't know if he's a personality disorder. I don't know if he's a diagnosis. 
for personality disorder. But yes, thank you, Krista. Tim diagnosed himself. He said he was narcissistic. He said he felt like an imposter. I I can't say it better than that. Right. Right. Yes. Thank you, everyone. So just a reminder again, this Tuesday, Dr. John and I will be on Crime Nation on the CW network, which you can download for free, the app. Um, and it will be streaming the day after for anyone to watch it after about the Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow case. We uh, have links to our full Tim Ballard playlist. We have links to our Patreon account, patreon.com slash into crime, where you can go to FOIA and court documents. And we have hundreds of pages when it comes to Tim Ballard, including his uh, mini autobiography that we've started reading. And uh, we also have a link to our new sister station, station, sister station. That's what we said in the news, sister station, our sister channel, Hidden True Crime Trials, where we are following the Rust trial and not just following the Rust trial, but every day posting numerous uh, updates and hearings, even in the past that we want to revisit before the Chad Daybell trial, like Melanie Gibbs prelim testimony and others. So please join us over there for um, ongoing streaming. Thank you. And thank you to our mods that are here tonight and for our new mods on the trial channel. We appreciate you all so much. Lolo, thank you. She just said the trial channel is the best it is. And, and Lolo, thank you for being our mod over there and doing so much. Thank you. Um, there was one question. And you've answered this. Oh, let's see. No, thank you, Lady Sunflower, for your um, comment. But there was a question. And I know we've ended like three times now. So let's just make it a fourth. Let's let's end as many uh, civil lawsuits that Ballard now has. Tim Ballard now has five civil lawsuits, so we can end five times. Um, can you analyze why some of the public defend Ballard with so much fervor? Why is there such extreme hero worship? You sort of answered this in the past one, but the people are wondering, Dr. John. I think the, sh the short answer is confirmation bias that, People have a set view of the world and they don't want that view challenged. And they believe that Tim Ballard was a hero before and they're not going to change that view. They're completely invested in it. They want to confirm their view of the world. They want to see Tim Ballard as a hero no matter what, and they will no matter what. So it doesn't matter what evidence you present to them. They're emotionally invested in seeing Tim Ballard as a hero. They will not deviate from that. Many of them probably have the same rigid, oversimplistic worldview that he has. So they, they, they probably share similar attitudes and perceptions of the world. And as I said, as I said at the beginning, someone, the first comment I read was someone saying, I'm unsubscribing. You guys are so wrong. And, you know, that's fine. I think that we encourage people to disagree with us if they feel we like do. they have to unsubscribe. If they if they feel like they have to unsubscribe because it's that extreme, well, that that's too bad. I mean, but that's if that, that's what they need to do, that's fine. And we we tell it the way we see it. We're not always right. We try to be, but we you know we look at the evidence and make an assessment. I've been doing this for almost thirty years, and I I hope I've learned a few things. So, but it's still a perspective, and I'm wrong at times. But and so, but we want people to disagree. Let's. Let's have a dialogue. Let's figure it out together. You're not really wrong often. I'll be honest. I'm married to him. And you know the whole like, you always need to be right. John's usually right. When he's not right, I make a really big point of it because I would never want him to forget. And I will <laughs> never let him forget when I'm right. But for the most part, <laughs> I will never let him forget when I am right. But for the most part, I have to admit, he's usually right. I think so. The short answer is why do people want to stick to, to this belief about Tim Ballard? It's because they feel threatened. They feel threatened that if they're wrong, it'll somehow undermine their view of the world. I think that's the short answer. This is about fear and threat and not 
not being open to new information and not being willing to adapt and change one's point of view. Thank you, babe. Thank you for everyone for joining us tonight. And until next week, we plan to cover the Rust trial next week. I call it the Rust trial. It's the film about Rust, and the tragedy that happened on the set of Rust where Alec Baldwin was. And Alec Baldwin's uh, trial has now been set uh, for later this year, so we will be following it closely. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. All right. Good night, guys.